Hey, what's going on, Brewtubers? I got something very special for you guys today. Uh, Fermentation Nation here, aka Jared, and we are going to brew up my buddy Steve James Barr's Black IPA recipe. I've been promising Steve I would brew a beer of his for a while, so we kind of do some pen pal brewing. He's gonna brew a recipe of mine, and hopefully he'll put that out on YouTube as well. I'm gonna flash up the recipe for you guys right now. It's a solid looking recipe. It's got lots of bitterness, lots of flavor going on. Uh, looks like a good solid malt body, and it's gonna be a bigger beer. So uh, we're gonna do this beer all grain today. I'm gonna show you guys my basic all grain brewing method that I use. It's just batch sparging, simple coolers, pots, stuff like that. Nothing funny. Uh, I do use temp control fermentation. You guys will see that a bit later, a little bit later. And this is what I would call the first of four videos. So this is going to be an introduction to seeing the bit of uh, brewing equipment that I use to brew, and we'll actually brew the beer. After that, we'll go into uh, racking and dry hopping and how I do that. Then we'll go into crash cooling. You guys will see how I uh, get the yeast out of the beer. You'll get times and temperatures, stuff like that. How I do it. And finally, we go into packaging and tasting. You guys can see how I keg. And after the period of fermentation, secondary and dry hopping is all done, I actually just put it right in the keg, uh, 30 PSI, snap it on, carb it, and I'm drinking it right away. There's no waiting several days with cranked up PSIs and pressures and all kinds of crazy stuff. I don't do that. So uh, for those of you who haven't seen any of the videos that I've been putting out for years, they used to be called um, uh, Heavy Rift Beer on YouTube, sorry about that, I couldn't remember, and we did that before we opened the brewery. I'm the co-founder and head brewer of Heavy Rift Brewing Company here in St. Louis, Missouri. I started professionally brewing about late 2008, early 2009, kept with it ever since, brewed at several different places before opening my own. It's been a really good, really fun run, and I'd like to get back into doing some more uh, fermentation stuff with uh, home brewers and home cider making, wine making, things like that, pass on the knowledge that other home brewers were kind enough to pass on to me before I took the next step. So uh, you guys are along for the ride. I hope that you guys will get something out of the videos. And to Steve James Barr, my brother from another mother who lives down under, I can't wait to brew this beer up and try it. So let's get to it. All right, guys, on top of my buddy Scott's kegerator, I brew at my buddy Scott's house. He's nice enough to let me use his space. I've got uh, 15 pounds of two row. We're actually only gonna need about 13 and a quarter pounds of that. I've got the specialty malts you guys saw in the recipe. I've got the Amarillo and Citra hops down here. I forgot to take the Cascade hops out of the freezer. So they're still upstairs, but I'll get those before we need them. And we're gonna use two packs of SO5. We're gonna rehydrate that like you would normally do. Any other brew day. We're gonna use batch sparge method uh, and a basic beverage cooler with uh, false bottom. You guys will see all the equipment here in a minute. But I wanted to show you guys exactly what it looks like. I have not ground the, the grain yet. I just picked it up from the homebrew shop today. So uh, I'm really happy and excited about the recipe. Let's get to it. Here's a look at my equipment, guys, for my all grain home brewing. At one point in time, I had a Brutus 10 system I built from scratch. I also had a Blickman top tier and a lot of other things in between. But I actually went back to this. It's easy to keep clean. Uh, the parts really don't go bad. There's nothing to wear out on them. I can see how dirty or clean everything is and I really like that aspect. So I like to keep it simple. We do have a Blickman floor burner with leg extensions and a propane tank. And this is a about a nine gallon pot that I got from a Chinese restaurant supply store. I fitted a kettle valve weldless and a weldless Blickman brewmometer. There's no sort of filtration on the inside. The stainless steel pot. We've got oven mitts for moving around hot stuff. We have our mash tun. On the inside of the mash tun is just a standard braid like you would uh, see in a lot of other people's setups. It's not a full false bottom, just a regular stainless braid. And ball valve on that. I've got a pitcher and it's got some marks on the inside of it. You might be able to see that and that's a one gallon pitcher. I have a mash paddle. Had that for years. Got it from northernbrewer.com when I first started brewing. I've got a lighter. I've got a stainless steel spoon. I've got a bottle that is currently filled with star sand for sanitizing. I have what I consider to be the most important thing in my brewery setup and that is a traceable lab grade thermometer. No junk from a homebrew store can ever, ever replace a quality thermometer. You guys will be so much happier You'll be able to dial in all of your other gauges and things like that like on my pot I've got that thermometer. And if you want to, you can actually send this back to the company. They'll recalibrate it and then guarantee it again after I think it's two years. So it's a really good purchase. It's around 40 bucks. It's worth it. I have a hydrometer. 
I've got a jar that has a foam stopper in it. I'll put some water in that, put it in the microwave for about four minutes and boil it. It'll stay in the microwave all through the brew day. And when we're ready to rehydrate, I'll pull it out of there. It'll be right at room temperature or so. Dump in the yeast packets, put the foam back on top while we're cooling down. And by the time we're done cooling down the beer, it'll be ready to go. I've got an immersion chiller. Got this from Midwest Supplies in like, I don't know, 2006, 2007. Had it a long time, works good. And I just use a simple bucket and your standard three piece airlock for fermentation. In the back hiding there, you've got some 5.2 pH buffer. I use just a, I don't know, about half a tablespoon in my mash. And then I've got Fermate K as my yeast nutrient. Use whatever yeast nutrient you can get a hold of that your homebrew shop rec recommends. I just happen to like Fermate K. I know it's typically used more for wine and mead and stuff like that, but for me it works well in beer fermentations as well, and it's a little bit less expensive than the Saccharomyces pills that you buy from like White Labs or Weiss. So that's my basic brewing setup, and uh, oh, for water, down there you've got a standard GE water filter you can get from your local hardware store. It has a carbon filter in it. And then I've got a white potable water RV hose that will hook up to the spigot. So I've got water outside. And the water here in St. Louis is pretty good. It's neither hard nor soft. And it works really well for most beer styles. The only thing I have to change it is if I do like a cream ale or a Hellas, uh, something like that, I'll soften the water with a little bit of distilled water you just buy from the store. But that's pretty much it, guys. This is a real basic setup, and I apologize for the mess in the back. But my buddy does a lot of uh, amateur carpentry, and you know what? He lets me brew here for free. And that's awesome of them. So we're going to get started with the grain bill. You can see the grain mill in the background there. And next thing you guys will see will be me milling up some grain. So here we are, guys. I've got 13.4 pounds of American two-row malt. And I've got the special grains according to the recipe. Here's a grain mill. It's uh, just an old Schmidling malt mill. This is Scott's mill. I've got a different one, but that's what he has in the table he built for it. Trash can to collect the grain. And this is actually the old extract pot he used to use when he first started brewing, so still find some use in scale. Nothing fancy again, just uses a drill. And I apologize for the camera work, I'm flying completely solo today, so if it's a little shaky or annoying, I, I do apologize. So let me see if I can get this thing set up here and you guys can uh, see me mill. I won't keep the camera on the entire time that I'm milling, but uh, you'll, get the, you'll get the general idea. Into the water filter and out of the water filter. I need about four and three quarter gallons of mash in water. I use about 1.3 quarts per pound of grain. It's always served me well. And as soon as I get this collected, I'll get it heated up and we'll be uh, ready to mash in no time. All right, guys, I got the filtered water into my boil kettle and I've got the grain all crushed and I've got my mash tun. Flip this over for you guys real quick. It's got lots of beer stone in the inside. It's been used, that's for sure. But just a simple braid in the bottom, and it works great for me. I average 79 to about 81% efficiency on most beers. It'll be a little lower on this one because it's a bigger gravity beer, larger gravity beer. And for some reason, this time, once you get over about 1065 in gravity, it starts to lose a few points, but that's okay. Here's crushed grain. All right, let's get this in the mash tun and get that boil kettle fired up. There we go. The thing I like about this Blickman burner is it's nice and quiet. Well, now we wait to mash in, so I'll get back with you guys in a few minutes. Okay, guys, we're just about to mash in. Steve's recipe calls for a mash temperature in the mid-150 range, so I'm going to get my strike water to 168. That should settle around 153 or so. And let's check the temp on the mash water. The strike water. We're perfect, 168. Let's start mashing this puppy in. The color of this beer is about 30 SRM. Nice and dark. But it uses Carafa 3, which is Dehus, the special Carafa. So it should give us that dark color without adding so much of the roasty character that you get in stouts and porters and even some brown ales. Let's give it a stir and add some 5-2 buffer. 
It's a blend of salts for equalizing your mash at about 5.2, which is about ideal. I really don't use that, not the big rock there. I really don't use that much of it, guys. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's not very much. And stir it up. Make sure you don't have any dough balls. If you got dough balls, water can interact with the grain, and the starches will not convert to sugar, and you'll get a much lower efficiency. Right, feels pretty good. I wish I had a second camera right now because I'm at 153.3. Put the lid on there, set our timers for an hour. See you guys in a bit. Okay guys, we're ready to spar. It's been an hour and we're gonna do our boil off real quick. So let me pop the top off, mash ton. We're gonna measure out our first hop edition here in just a second. We got some Warrior, and we're gonna get about uh, 0.7 ounces. You wanna have a good scale. I like these little Scali Primos, they're a nice scale. I use it quite a bit. Got a big bag of the old Warrior, my favorite bittering hop by far. The, uh, I get out of here, fly. The uh, sparge is almost there. See, we got about four and a half gallons coming out, still dripping a little bit, so. We're gonna hit about dead on with the amount of liquid we would put back in the mash tun. And we'll take a gravity reading in just a minute and get it boiling. All right guys, the batch sparge is done. We ended up getting four and a half gallons out of the sparge and we had two and a half to start with. So we only over sparge by about a half gallon. That's nothing, that's just the little drippings trickling out at the very end. Took a half gallon of that, tossed it away. We got six and a half gallons in our boil kettle. We got our first hop addition measured out. I'm gonna use my refractometer to take a pre-boiled gravity reading. And what this does is measures the density of sugar water compared to regular water. So um, we're gonna go ahead and do that and we're gonna get stirred before we do it to make sure all of the wort is mixed up evenly and we'll get a good consistent temperature on it, or I'm sorry, a good consistent uh, saturation of sugars throughout the entire mixture. It's always nice and dark. That perfect Cascadian Dark Ale or Black IPA. I prefer it to say Cascadian Dark Ale. Flynn on the mound. Lid is on. Let's get it boiling. The Cubs were. Alright, looks like we hit about 1066 pre boiled. That's solid. We've got uh, everything boiling. And we're about a minute and a half away from some hops. We're going to do uh, 0.7 ounces of Warrior. All right, 7 o'clock. Toss them in. I don't use a hop bag or anything like that. I used to. I'm not against them. I'll come back to you guys when it's time for uh, the flavor and aroma additions of uh, some beautiful hops. And we'll add the wort chiller, some wort lock tabs to clarify. Well, at least one wort lock tab to clarify. And our yeast nutrient. All right, guys, we're uh, over halfway through the boil, and it's time to get the last uh, boil additions ready. We got uh, Cascade, we got uh, Amarillo, and we have Citra per Steve's recipe, 1.4 ounces each. Let's cut them open and get it done. All right, we're getting towards the end of the day here. We've uh, come to the flavor slash aroma edition. Steve just uses one big edition of those Cascade and the uh, Amarillo and Citra hops, and we'll do another amount, uh, same amount of hops, but dry hop when we're done with fermentation, primary fermentation. I've already gone ahead and added my wort chiller, so it'll sterilize in the boil. It's already cleaned before I added it. I have a Wurflock tablet. Okay. Some of you guys call this Irish Moss tabs, things like that. 
It just helps proteins to coagulate and settle to the bottom. I'm going to toss that in. And we've got Fermate K, our yeast nutrient. We use about, I don't know, half a cap full, whatever that is. Just about ready to add these hops in. About a minute or so. They really do smell absolutely fantastic. Mm. Here we go. Oh my god, what a smell that is. All right guys, let's do this re yeast rehydration thing. So there's the water that I went ahead and boiled in the microwave uh, earlier in the day before we started, or right when we started the brew day. We've got two packs of SO5. This is a higher gravity beer, so we want to get that cell count up. Rehydrating will assure that we get as max, uh, um, the maximum cell count that we can out of these packs. I've got star sand in a spray bottle. I've sprayed the packs. I've gone ahead and sprayed this pocket knife, which is nice and clean, and then sprayed it with the star sand so it's nice and sterile. And all I'm going to do is literally pop, the, pop off the uh, foam stopper here cut these open and toss them in and uh, we'll give it a little stir, uh, just a little shake and let it sit. Alright guys, I couldn't get it much below 82, uh, that's just the temperature I can get right now. So. What's going to happen is I'm going to go ahead and drain into the sanitized uh, fermenter and I'm going to stick it in the fermentation fridge for about an hour and a half. It's sitting about 36 degrees. That'll drop it down to around 70 or so. We're going to ferment it at 68. Once it gets around 70, I'll go ahead and pitch the yeast. You guys saw me make it. It was just a uh, you know, rehydration of yeast, man. No big deal. So let's go ahead and uh, get it in the fermenter and we'll dump it in, uh, dump the yeast in a little hey bit Hey guys, later. Fermentation Nation here aka Jared, I have a very special beer in my glass. This is the follow-up to the Brew Pal that I did with Mr. Steve James Barr, my southern, very southern brother from another mother, and I appreciate the recipe that he gave me. It's a black IPA. You guys can see it's super dark in the glass. It looks wonderful. It's holding a little bit of head. Not a, not a ton of head, but that's nothing that I really worry about. And I brewed this uh, several months ago. I moved in the middle of brewing this beer to when I got it on tap, and I apologize for the length and delay in which that it has taken me to actually taste it and get it, you know, uh, get a review for you guys. But let's give it a smell. There's an absolute crap ton of just citrusy hops in this dry hop of this one. So I think there's Amarillo and Citra and possibly Cascade. It's it's kind of escaping right now, but uh, the the overtones are definitively citrus. It's wonderful smelling. You can actually pour just like a half a glass of this, set it on your desk, your table, and you're like, man, I, I'm smelling grapefruit. This is awesome. Uh, it's very dark, but does not have roasty overtones. So the uh, Carafa malt is doing its job. It's giving us all the color that we want without going into that stout or sort of porter realm, or even brown ale. It's it's really holding its own as a Cascadian dark ale, black IPA sort of a thing. A little richer than medium body. Uh, that would be the only detraction I have is that it does drink like a, a bit of a, a bigger beer than it is uh, as far as the style guideline, which it's not definitive on the style guideline, but uh, it does drink closer to a porter or a brown than it does to an IPA, which uh, that would be my only detraction because it has a nice bitterness. It kind of pursues the uh, malt character down your throat. It's got a real caramely malt body. Uh, it's got a, a t just a touch of that chocolate character, but it doesn't really overwhelm the beer, and it finishes nice and clean. That SO5 yeast uh, really leaves beer you know, really dry. This attenuated quite well. And uh, I find it to be a, a really nice beer and a really nice recipe, and I can't wait to brew it again. So, Steve James Barr, thank you, brother. I appreciate the recipe, and uh, cheers, guys. We'll, uh, we'll do it again.